Let's kick it. <laughs> Hello and welcome to what's new in 2257. As you can see today we're starting off on one of our old friends, the log on screen. Not because it's got any new functionality this time, it although it has a little bit, but a bit more because it's onto its third technology already. And it started off with HTML in 2211 and then it graduated onto C and the normal create window function which we use from user 32. And now it's graduated from there and it's onto a technology called Direct User. Now that's new in this build and it still exists in Windows to this day. And it's a Microsoft specific technology, so if you're writing programs for Windows, you can't use it because there's no documentation on how to use it. So yeah, it's a, and this provides all these fancy transitions without them having to break their backs, calling Move Window and all the other functions which do that. You see that when you click on it and it moves them out. All these fancy transitions are built up in code and direct user executes them. Now like I said the logon screen has a little bit of new functionality in this build but you normally won't see it because nothing calls the functions to enable it. Now what am I blabbering on about? If we go to shell 32 and see what the new functions are we can see there's functions here regarding mail accounts like set unread mail, get unread mail and enumerate the unread mail accounts. Now, I presume this is meant to be called by Outlook Express, which obviously handles all the emails, but it doesn't actually call this set account, so as, not, as nothing ever calls it, it never shows up on the logon screen. So what I have done, when I get there, is I've created a registry script when I find out where it is, Red mail, there it is. As you can see, the key we're interested in is its key current user software, Microsoft Windows, current version, unread mail. And then what you create under unread mail is a email address user account. Well, an email address. Doesn't have to actually be the account using Outlook Express. Then you need a message count value with how many messages, a timestamp, which is meant to be when it last checked for messages, and an application which it can use to start the actual, you know, opening the mail. Although I set it to win for any to see if anything actually executes that. So what we do is set that in the registry. And then if we log off, we now get this unread mail messages underneath the oh, user tile. Now you can't click on it to like open the mail because like the um, command is meant to do. That's not built into this version, so you can't do that. I don't know if it makes an appearance in a later version, because I haven't looked at the later versions yet. But anyway, that's the little bit of new functionality in this. I noticed there's a bug in the logon screen as well. And if I just log off again to show you, as you've already seen, if I type a password in here, then it comes up with the normal circles. The password character is in the updated user updated common controls. But if I do that and then log off with the switch user option, which keeps me logged on, and then if I click on it, get a hint, and then start typing in it. Instead of the circles, you get these lines. So yeah, it's just a little bug that I found on the logon screen. Anyway, our first new thing in this build is a utility, and it's called FSUtil. Now, if you're a casual Windows user, you've probably never used FSUtil because it's still in Windows to this day. And if you're an advanced Windows user, you've probably never used FSUtil, even though it's in Windows to this day. If anybody did ever use it, it's probably just for one thing, and that was to disable the NTFS last access time updating, which improved the performance of the file system. 
but that was before Windows 7 made that the default behavior. But yeah, so it's actually, FS Util is actually quite broken in this build. For one thing, if you go to FS Util hard link, which is for hard link management, and it lets you create a hard link. Hopefully this is the, somebody who was German who did this and put an E on the end of it. So if you do that though, you can't actually do that because it doesn't recognize it as a supported command. So it just gives you the original list of commands. So that doesn't work. It also quite crashes if you go to FS Util Behavior. Careful not to put a U in it. And query. Well, I'll just show you that. You can query and you can set. And if you go to query, it crashes. So yeah, it's not bulletproof quite yet. It's also quite hard to use. I mean, it's meant to be an advanced tool anyway. But if you go to set, you can see that it's quite an arcane interface with all these not very well documented things you can set. And as opposed to in Windows 7, where if I, you have to run it as administrator in Windows 7. If you go to FSU till behavior set. You can see it's quite a bit better documented these days. So yeah, it's FSU tool and it crashes quite a lot. Also new in this build is a new view size for these icons in the quick launch toolbar. Now normally you get the small icons and these large icons have been there for a while. But what hasn't been there before is this logos option. Now if you install this yourself and put the quick launch toolbar on and then look at this menu, you won't see this logos option. Because if we look at the code, the code which actually loads this menu from the resources deletes the third option, which in this case is the logos option. And it deletes that so you wouldn't see it. But not only does it delete it once in case that in case that doesn't work, further down it actually deletes it again. So so you're des they desperately didn't want you to see this. And why didn't they want you to see this? Well, if you click on it, nothing happens. That's why they didn't want you to see this, because it doesn't do anything. But yeah, it's a, I suppose it's meant to make them even bigger than that. And we may see in a future build, I don't know, I haven't installed and looked at them yet. We may see in a future build that option working. Or we may not, because in Final XP it's not there, so it doesn't exist that far into the future, but maybe in one of these interim builds, it will. Now as you can imagine with this being alpha slash beta software, there are bugs to be found. And this particular one is in a shortcut um, properties dialog. It can be any shortcut, it doesn't have to be to a folder, it can be to a program or anything else. Then as you can see, we can quite happily navigate between these tabs. And if you click find target, and then you click cancel or OK then you can no longer navigate to those tabs because it sort of dies a bit and then you can see the dialog still here cancel didn't work and OK didn't work and we're still slightly having problems with it it's sort of working OK now then but can eventually it goes back to working but what happens though is if you create if you do that quite a few times, then you click cancel and then you do it again, then this tab becomes completely unkillable. You can't get out of it at all. Now there was another bug here which happened when I was testing and if you create loads and loads of windows like this, I think it was about 54 was a sweet spot. Yep, you can't create another one now, there's, we've run out of window resources in this desktop and what happened was I clicked minimize group and it minimized the actual desktop window the, all the icons disappeared and there was no text there and it was just blue because it disappeared and then it it was at the top of this list it was in the list and I could manipulate it like any other window and then if you closed the group it actually closed the desktop and I could no longer exit or do anything with the desktop because it disappeared but as of right now, I can't actually get it to happen again, so let's just do one last test. 
No. So I can't get it to that to happen again, but this tab's still here, it won't disappear at all. These buttons still work, but it doesn't fancy leaving us. And to get rid of it, you have to kill Explorer and restart. Explorer, not system. So you may have noticed then that when Explorer died, Task Manager lost its theming. As of these early builds with the theming, it's all controlled by Explorer. So if Explorer is dead, you don't really get any theming. Even though it's not dependent on Explorer in any way, shape or form. But as you can see, if you kill it, then Task Manager is okay for now. But then this new window doesn't have any theming. And then when you open that window, Task Manager loses its theming. So, yeah, it's all tied to Explorer theming in these early versions. Another feature they introduced in this build is the ability for arbitrary processes which aren't debuggers to pause other processes and suspend them so they don't consume any resources whatsoever and then resume them. Sort of like hibernation, but for individual processes. And if I go to the bits folder and I find what I've called my thing which does this, I suspend resume. Right, so many things for this, I have to remember how to call them. Oh, it just needs the process ID. So if you use Process Explorer as the program to pause, we can, it's 11.32. So there you go, Process Explorer is now suspended. You can't do anything with it, can't interact with it, can't bring it to the foreground. You can't right click on its thing to bring up the menu because there's nothing to handle that. As you can see, there's absolutely no way to interact with it. You can show the desktop, which makes it minimize, but it, you can't bring it back to the top or anything. And if we can enter, then it brings it back up again, and it works. So yeah, this is due to this is due to some functions which were added to NTDLL. So I think they may be for some. I don't know what components they're for actually, but with them being NTDLL and not kernel 32, they're not really meant for user consumption. Here they are: NT resume process and NT suspend process. So yeah, uh, but up until now, only debuggers were able to processes which attach to other processes as debuggers were able to pause them and resume them. But now, any program which actually calls those functions can now pause and resume other processes for some reason. There's a couple of slight differences to do with the start menu in this build. As you can see, it's like the one in the last build but it doesn't have the Whistler thing on the top and this blue is slightly different. And also one change you can see here, my documents has been retitled my files. And you can actually make this three, three um, panes wide if you go to properties and customize start menu. If you include this list of most recently used documents then what that actually does is open a different start menu. It's actually two separate start menus. And it opens the three wide one and it brings up all these files in the middle bit. As you can see, it's not quite implemented properly. There's a, a white box that cuts through the files text at the top and down here at the bottom as well. But yeah, you get a three wide start menu and that's pretty much what I wanted to tell you about that. Also with the start menu, there's a funky thing you can do. If you open it, then normally if you click off it, it disappears. But if you open it, then hold shift and click start, it keeps it open. So you can then do whatever you want to do, and it keeps the start menu on top. So it's quite handily dandily if you want to do a couple of things. If you click on anything though, it'll disappear. So it doesn't stay open eternally, but if you hold shift when you click the start button, you can tell that the taskbar sort of comes on top of it. 
and that tells you that it's now stuck and on top. If you click on it and click off it, it'll disappear. So it doesn't stay on until you select out. If you just click on it and then click off it, it disappears. Alternatively, if you've got this new stat menu enabled, if you hold shift before you click the stat button at all, you get the old stat menu. I don't think anybody's ever documented that, or if they have, I haven't seen mention of it. You can't do it the other way around if you have the if you have the classic stat menu enabled, as I'll show you. If you have that enabled, hold and shift doesn't change to the new menu. It just keeps the old menu on. So yep. You need to be on it only works for the new menu. So yeah, that's something I haven't seen anybody mention before. Neither the on top or the shift to get back to the old stat menu. Remember in the last build, or the build before, I showed you how to enable clear type before there was any UI for it? Well, in this build we finally got some UI for it. If you go to display properties, the appearance tab, and the effects tab, we now get this option, smooth edges of screen fonts, show me, and it's not enabled by default. And you get this, another. if you click show me, you get this actual representation of what it'll look like. So if you click it, it sort of smooths standardly, and standardly, that's no word, and if you click on clear type, then you get the clear type rendering. Unfortunately, if you turn it on and turn it off again, you can't judge the difference for clear type because it always resets to the top one. So, yeah, the clear type one looks better than the standard one, but I still don't like it. I still prefer all the, the sharp edges and all that. But you can turn it on via the UI now as opposed to just having to go in splunking in the registry to turn it on like that. Another new thing you can do in this build is create broadband connections in network and dial-up connections. And what do I mean by that? If you go to make new connection, uh, next, then you can use this middle option now. I think it's that one? Or is it? Yeah, it's the middle one. And then now you can uh, there's a new option at the bottom here, it says connect to the network via broadband. And uh, you connect via PPPoE. And if you connect, you create a service name. And you don't have to fill in. So I don't. And only for myself, will do. And then you finish, and you'll get this nice new, well it's not a new dialogue, but you don't really get to see it because it's only in the dial-up it's in some sort of the dial-up anyway, one of the dialogues down there. So you can create a username and password, all these fancy properties you can have now. Like the personal firewall, which is new for this build as well, which is only for this connect show, because they've missed it enough. I'm not sure it's the dialogue big enough, the, the static box big enough. So yeah, you can create things with this, and you can add a password in. It's not going to work because I don't have a one mini part available. So it's not going to work, and eventually it will time out. Eventually it times out, and you get this there was no answer, and it will redial, or you can just exit, and we'll just exit. But yeah, the broadband connection creation is new for this build. Another thing that you can do in this build, if you open a folder with these folder tasks on the side, if you just open up a folder, and you like click on details or other places so you can do anything on this pretty much and you can drag it over here let go and you get a folder what well, a shortcut and it's named with the name of what you dragged across and what it actually does is open the windows web folder which is where all the code for these things resides so yeah i don't know if i think that's a bug but yeah you can do that if you really want to don't know why you wouldn't to but that's something i discovered One minor update to this build, which looks rather useless on the face of it, is in Notepad. I know, Notepad actually getting updates, and what it is, is this view menu here. It's not in the last build or anything previously, and what you do is you get a status bar, which looks pretty useless, doesn't it? I mean, you can type a bit, and it tells you what line and what column you're on, but otherwise, it looks pretty useless. But this left bit is used when you open a file. So if I open something so 
say this for example, then it tells you the attributes of the file. So this is, I've compressed this drive with NTFS compression, so you get compressed file. And if it was hidden, it's a compressed comma hidden file, and if it was archived, it's a compressed comma archive file, and all that good stuff. But yeah, so that makes it slightly less useless, but it's not really useful at all. It's still there to this day, it does the same thing. So I don't know why it was added, because it's pretty much redundant. But added it was. Now there's one note I just want to make about Notepad, which I just showed you then. And you can see that it's all blue in the middle instead of white. Now this is part of the theme which is commented out in this build. And also pretty much everything to do with edit boxes is commented out in this build. So, But the focused colour is set to pretty much the same as the background, desktop background colour. I don't know why that is because it makes it look sort of, I don't know, the text is white in there. The highlight colour is still the same dark blue so you can hardly see it. And the cursor is still the eye beam so you can still hardly see that in there. But yeah, if it loses focus, it's white. Another change in the commented out in this theme is the colour of the text in list views, which is what the desktop is. As you can just about see the recycle bin, which is a sort of reddish maroon colour. It's more easily seen if we open up this. You can see the pink labels as well. They're new. Commented out, well, commented out in this theme. Yeah, and the, f the selection when you mouse over something is future. That's also commented out. So yeah, there's quite a lot in this theme which was commented out for this build and for previous builds. And here's the list view more generally. I like this future colour with the maroon text. It sort of works quite well. I'm not sure it goes with the blue, but it, it works quite well, I think. And again, when you highlight that, that still goes purple. And that's slightly less goes well with it. So yeah, that's just a little tour of the commented out bits of the theme. I'll just continue doing that in future videos and I don't really think I'll mention it then because you'll be able to tell what's different from when, you, when you've installed them normally and looked at them. Some of the more obvious changes in this build are the branding changes to the more in-your-face bits of Windows. By that I mean the boot screen, which has obviously changed from that to this and also there's changes not just for the client builds all this also has changes for the server builds so that's what it used to look like and that's what it looks like now I think you can sense the theme developing here and likewise there's one for I think it's six yep the little insert bits they've been changed as well one thing that hasn't changed though is this dialog which is for hibernating and turning off and as we see if we do that no I don't know that's the wrong way to do it that won't show it I need shut down no, what did I call it oh, I really wish I could remember what I called these things it shuts it off that's what I called it and eventually you will see that the dialogue didn't change, but the branding in it did. And there you can see, now we got the... It is now safe to turn off your computer. The dialogue, that don't, bit doesn't move. The middle bit doesn't move, but yeah, it's codenamed Whistler, and it's using a bit worse for wear logo. It doesn't look terribly crisp. But yeah, this bit's also been changed. That's going to just about do it for part 1, come join me in part 2 where, amongst other things, we'll see the new system restart in action and some fun things to do with the exports and the resources. See you then!